This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Mark's record of the crucifixion of our Lord is slightly different than the other gospel writers. He uh, omits some of the facts that the others include, and uh, though we're studying Mark, you've seen me, uh, particularly in this section, go back to uh, Luke's account and Matthew's account. We'll do that in this study, too. But with an economy of words, he gives us a description of those events very powerfully. Just five verses tell us the story. Mark 15, beginning in verse 22. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. In verse 34 of Mark 15, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in verse 37, Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. That's a brief account, isn't it? Let me go back to verse 22. They brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. I took this picture of the place of a skull on my trip to Israel. It looks the same as it did nearly 2,000 years ago. If you go to Jerusalem, you want to go to the garden tomb. And just outside of the garden tomb, you will find the place of the skull. There's not much question among uh, those who are careful in their investigation about these things that the Church of the Holy Su Sepulcher it cannot be the place where Golgotha was located. And the fact that the, the garden tomb and the place of the skull was actually under a trash heap for hundreds and hundreds of years and, and therefore was preserved, it's, it's much more likely that that's the place where Jesus was crucified. From verse 37 on, the focus of Mark's gospel is not on Jesus per se, but on the people who were around the cross. And we're going to talk about that in, the, in a future episode. The, the reaction of the people who were surrounding the cross because it's, it's very interesting to see the different kind of reactions to this awful event. They represent the kind of attitudes and actions that people possess with regard to Jesus even to this day. So I, I, I want to do that. I want to look at some of those characters uh, we're not going to look at all of them this morning, but we'll come back to that. But I do want you to see the first one that comes into this picture. Simon, the one who carried Jesus' cross. In Matthew 15 and verse 21, They pressed him into service, a passerby, coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. On his way from Pilate's judgment hall to the cross, which if, if you go to, the, to Jerusalem and you were to walk out of the southern steps, as Jesus likely did, and across the Hinnom Valley over to the place where the garden tomb is located, you would, you would see that there... Uh, that it would be very difficult to exert any energy after you have been beaten within an inch of your life. As I mentioned, 
in the process of scourging, many people died or were disemboweled or were blinded. Many m went mad. History records men who lost their minds in that torture. And now, after being tortured, Jesus is carrying his cross, but he stumbles. And this man, Simon of Cyrene, is grabbed by one of the Roman soldiers. It must have been a, a grim day for Simon. Palestine was being occupied by the Romans, and the Roman government could ask any citizen under his charge at any time to do anything that they wanted him to do. And it took only the tap of a shoulder by a Roman soldier to call you into action. Simon, Mark says, was from Cyrene in Africa. And undoubtedly, he had come to Jerusalem on the occasion of the Passover. He was then a godly man coming a great distance to worship God. And at that moment that he was pulled from the crowd and, and forced to carry the cross of Jesus, he must have felt some bitterness toward being chosen. But the Bible gives us some indication later on of some good news about what eventually happened to Simon of Cyrene. I think, I think we have some really good news about him. In Acts chapter 13, for example, a list of given is given of certain men who were members of the church at Antioch. And that's the church that was established by Paul and Barnabas as they were sent into the Gentile world to preach the gospel. Listed among those men is one by the name of Simeon called Niger. And, and Simeon is just another form of Simon, maybe the most formal form. Uh, my name is Michael Scott. I call and use the nickname Mike. You know me as Mike, but my formal name is Michael. Simeon is the formal name of Simon, and he is called in Acts from Niger. And Niger refers to someone who, is, who has black skin. Cyrene was in Africa. So we have a, a, a picture then of this man who was called into service, who is now in Acts chapter 13 listed among the brothers there in that church. Can you see this? That man who carried Jesus' cross, in my mind, without any doubts, became a Christian as a result. That man who came all the way from Africa to serve God at Passover in Jerusalem became a Christian. So there's, that's the first indication of good news in this terrible and tragic story. There's something else that I want you to see. Did you notice that Mark tells us that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus? And that's, that's very detailed information that, uh, and, and you, you've heard me say many times, the Holy Spirit doesn't waste words, and it doesn't tell us names unless there's real significance there. The only reason that Mark would have mentioned Alexander and Rufus is because his readers would have known who Alexander and Rufus were. They would have been able to identify who they were. And in, in uh, Romans chapter 14, Paul mentions Rufus, who had been a close associate and whose mother had been especially kind to the Apostle Paul. And, and, and so here's how you put this together. If the Rufus that Mark mentions and the Rufus that Paul mentions in, in uh, Romans are the same Rufus, then the husband of that mother of Rufus, who had been so kind to Paul, would have been none other than Simon of Cyrene's wife. 
You see how that all fits together here? I want to talk about now that suffering servant when we come back in just a minute. Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. The cross of Christ has to be central to everything that Christians teach and believe. And while it's true that there are many things that the church can do that are important, we should never get very far away from this scene. This is the heart of Christianity. There are millions, billions of souls in this world who have never heard this message, never heard the simple message of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, and the fact that he was innocent. I want you to see this in Isaiah 53 and verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before it shears, so he did not open his mouth. And Isaiah 53 and verse 9 says, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Jesus is described as a lamb being led to the slaughter. There's a painting of the crucifixion that concentrates on the actual nailing of the two thieves of our Lord uh, that, that were crucified with our Lord and their respective crosses. And in the painting, the two thieves are fighting not to be nailed to a cross. They're, they're kicking, they're biting, they're doing whatever they can. But Jesus calmly lays on his cross, outstretches his arms. He was not struggling to receive the nails. He was like a lamb that was led to slaughter. And he was innocent. I want you to think with me for a moment about how troubled we are when innocent people suffer. When an innocent child suffers. How do you feel? When someone who is innocent is accused and convicted of a crime, even, even executed wrongly, how does it make you feel? Our culture is aghast at the kind of things that happen to innocent people. There was a show on television a number of years ago called Quincy. It had its appeal in this way. Quincy was always right, you remember? But he always had to fight against the local governmental officials to prove them that they were wrong. And as you watched the show, you got angry because you felt like you were fighting against the apathetic establishment for the person who was innocent. Going back even a little further, maybe some of you remember watching the Perry Mason, Perry Mason show. Part of its appeal was that Perry Mason almost always got the defendant off, much to the chagrin of D.A. Berger and Lieutenant Tragg. And, and, and the appeal of the show again was we, we would get angry when the innocent were wrongly accused. Should we not be filled with rage with what was done to Jesus? Should not that motivate us to proclaim what happened to Jesus to the ends of the earth? And while understanding his innocence is so important, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough that he lived a perfect life. He also had to make a perfect sacrifice. Jesus had to die. 
Someone has said the doctrine of atonement is one of the surest proofs of the inspiration of Holy Scripture. Who would or who could have thought of the just ruler dying for the unjust rebel? The suffering of Christ was complete. We'll talk more about that when we come back in just a minute. The suffering of Christ was complete. When we read of the suffering of the servant in Isaiah 53, we ought to be impressed with the completeness of his suffering. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due? Because he poured out himself unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Throughout Old Testament history, when this section of Isaiah was, was taught to the people and identified as, as messianic, Jewish people were perplexed because the suffering of this servant was so complete. Who was this innocent person who was given these stripes, who was wounded, who was bruised, who was put to death. Who was this person who was led like a lamb to slaughter? And the answer is clearly seen in the crucifixion of Jesus. Crucifixion was the most terrible way to torture and kill a person. It, to this day, has to be the most torturous manner of death ever invented by man. Cicero, uh, the ancient Roman emperor, uh, a Roman author, wrote about crucifixion. He witnessed many crucifixions. The Romans loved to crucify people that they wanted to bring to judgment. He said that the victims of crucifixion often became madmen. He said they, they had fevers and thirst. Infections would ravage their bodies, bringing pain and exhaustion and other problems. Crucifixion could last for days in some cases. And because the screams of the individuals who were being crucified were so horrific, the Roman soldiers often would cut the tongue out of the man who was being crucified so that his cries would be muffled. It was horrible. It was bloody. The position on the cross made breathing difficult. Cramps would begin to set in, especially in the muscles of the arms. In order for a person to breathe on the cross, he would have to push up with his legs and lift up with his arms. And the nails would tear at his flesh and he would do this. And slowly but surely his strength would be zapped. And in desperation, he would try to exert himself over and over again to breathe. When they came to break the legs of those on the cross, Jesus was already dead. The breaking of the legs would hasten death on the cross, since it would make breathing much more difficult. But the question is, why? Why was Jesus already dead? If in some instances crucifixion could last days, why was he dead? And the answer is he was planned. The suffering of Jesus was planned. It was planned for you and for me. 
It was not an accident. It was planned. Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Isaiah 53 and verse 10 says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Although the Jews wondered as they would read Isaiah, who, who could possibly fulfill these verses? And when it came to fruition, they did not expect it. God did. He planned it that way. And God didn't just tell us that we needed to repent of our sins and tell us that we needed to be good. He showed us how to do that. It was impossible for him to just tell us of our sin. He had to graphically demonstrate how bad sin is. And he did that in this place. We've run out of time this morning. We're going to come back to this section as difficult as it is for us to study so that we can see this suffering servant who means so much to all of us. See you next week. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.